Welcome back after our break. Anybody else feeling a little intense after not only the incredible sessions this morning, but also like the music that was under that contest that was just going on? I'm like, it's got me on like complete tilt here. So we're all gonna have a little bit of some quiet <laughs> and some stillness as we're gonna consider together the well-being of our souls. Often I wonder, uh, kind of like, what's, what's the point, really, of talking about the soul and specifically caring for the soul with a bunch of pastors, right? A bunch of pastors and ministers, leaders. Aren't you all saved? Hasn't the deal been done? Haven't you crossed that line? Hasn't the soul issue been settled for you? Really, what's the point of talking about the soul to pastors and specifically us? I think based on everything we've heard this morning, maybe we're starting to realize we're the ones who may need to hear this the most. I know I didn't consider the well-being of my own soul when my husband and I were church planting back in Boston, back in the 90s. It was many years ago now, but I remember vividly the morning I woke up halfway through those years and everything in my field of vision was moving. I had some pretty scary neurological symptoms. Now my soul was saved, but I thought, that the most important thing was just to keep working as hard as I possibly could for the sake of the kingdom and the gospel that God invited us to share with others and maybe try to be like Jesus along the way, try to behave and be kind and good and loving and all those things. But when I woke up like this, uh, it turns out it makes you really nauseous. And for the next few months, I sent, entered into a season of completely forced rest. I couldn't walk a straight line. I couldn't read. I couldn't watch television or videos. I could not do anything. And it was very difficult to sleep even. In the midst of this church planting ministry, in a season through that time, God invited me to very graciously consider the well-being of my own soul. And today I want to challenge you to consider some of these same truths about the well-being of your soul, the well-being of a saved soul, and ironically, a soul that could be lost. So let's start our journey with what I imagine might be the most famous rhetorical question of all time. You know it well from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' words. How could you benefit if you gained the whole world but forfeited your soul? Hello. Good morning. It's still morning. How could you benefit if you gained the whole world but forfeited your soul? Or what could you give in exchange for your soul? Now, in the context I grew up in, we would usually consider this as an evangelistic appeal. Maybe you can relate to this. We say to people, and rightly so, how would you benefit if you chased after all the wrong things in life and ended up forfeiting your eternity with God? But there are two really important points from this text that I want to have us notice together. The first, and you have to look in your like, Bible or scroll up if you want, at the beginning of the paragraph, we see that Jesus is not talking to the, wild, you know, the crowd of people who are far from him. If you look in your Bible, it's very clear. He is talking to his disciples. He's talking to the ones that are already in a very close relationship with him. That's of interest. The second thing is that the word for soul in the NIV, you know, translated NIV soul, in the Greek, some of you Greek scholars, you know this, it's the word suke. Suke. In verse 26, translated soul. In verse 25, translated life. If you gain your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Verse 25, suke is life. Verse 26, suke is soul. The point here, biblically speaking, your soul is your life. 
The idea of soul, biblically speaking, is inextricably woven together with the idea of your personhood, your whole life. It is not some Jesus bumper sticker that gets scanned at the pearly gates and beep, you can make it through. Okay, it is not an inert toggle switch that has an on off saved or unsaved status. Your soul is bound together with this idea of your life. This is true in the Old Testament, it's true, uh, where the first time the word soul is used in a human context is at creation, when God forms Adam out of the earth and breathes into him and he becomes, he becomes a living being in a fesh. And throughout the Old Testament, when nefesh is present, life is present. When life departs, nefesh departs. Soul, life. During that season in Boston, I often couldn't sleep at night. If you've had physical symptoms like that where you've been sidelined from your own life, you may know seasons like that. And there was a time I sensed God asking me this very simple question, you know, uh, and let me paint a broader picture. I was running the whole back end of my, the church. I was doing all the finances, all the communications. My husband, and he speaks about it and writes about it pretty openly now, but he was probably in a full-on chemical depression. We had no language for that. This is, you know, back in the early 90s, we had no language for that. We didn't know what was happening. All I knew was to keep working harder and harder and harder. So I'm trying to support him. I'm running the whole back end of the church. I uh, was, had a two-year-old. I was pregnant with our second child, and I was leading at least three small groups. Because who else is going to do it? Who else is going to do it? And in the middle of the night, I sensed God saying, remember that verse you were having all three of your small groups memorize? John 15, 5, we've heard it this morning even. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. We love that. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I, I do believe God has the best sense of humor of anyone, right? And I sensed him saying, lovingly but clearly, what part of nothing didn't you understand? And guys, there was a lot about nothing that I didn't understand. The Psalms would tell me, where could I go from my spirit? If I go to the far side of the sea, you are there. If I even go to the gates of Hades, you are there. What does apart from me mean? Romans would say, neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God, right? So what, there was actually a lot about nothing that I didn't understand. Apart from me, what did Jesus mean? He's talking to his closest in disciples at that last supper, and he's saying, apart from me, and he's about to leave. What does he mean, apart from me? Some years uh, after this time, I had a, uh, a, something happened in the backyard. We lived in Illinois for many years, and uh, we had a big, huge tree in a backyard, and a big windstorm blew through. And you've heard that Chicago is referred to as the Windy City. Uh, I think it has to do with the politics, not the weather. <laughs> No, that's true. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, a windstorm came through, and this is a huge tree, and the entire canopy of the tree emerged from two central branches. And this windstorm blows through, and literally half the tree falls. And I just sense God saying, notice. No notice something about this tree. Now, what do you notice about this tree? Leaves are still green. Do you wonder whether or not, if that were, say, a fruit tree, do you think it might bear fruit next year? That tree has become severed from its source. The metaphor Jesus gives us in John 15 about a vine and a branch and being connected to that vine, and that in and of itself that vine has life. And to the extent to which we are meaningfully connected in real time, that life force flows through that point of connection and out into us the branch and bears much fruit. But apart from that source, that branch, it'll look good for a few more days. It might even look good for a couple weeks. 
And we're kind of like that. We can begin dis become disconnected from our source in real time. We become disconnected. And everything seems to still work, at least for a while. There's enough life in the system. We can keep leading meetings, we keep preaching, maybe for a while. But when we are utterly disconnected, and friends, we disconnect all the time. Storms come through, we disconnect from God, we forget. And then we forget that we forgot, but he is with us, and he loves us, and he's for us, and he is able. We are unlike that tree, though. And Jesus knows this in bringing us this metaphor that has endured for thousands of years. We are unlike that tree, because unlike that tree, we can reconnect. And we do this. We do this in interpersonally. We do this with God. We can disconnect and reconnect and disconnect and reconnect. But the whole point is about connection. And when we disconnect, when those storms of life come through, when we disconnect, utterly predictable symptoms of disconnection emerge in our lives. Utterly, utterly predictable. I think of it as benign neglect, when our soul has started to be neglected, when we've disconnected. Nobody sets out to do it, but it happens. And when it does, these things happen. We have these symptoms. And some of us have been very disconnected for a very long time. Our beliefs might be intact, our resolve for ministry is still strong. But we start to see fear take hold, anger be how we live, we're becoming angry people, fatigue, apathy, insomnia, physical symptoms like what I had, even deep anxiety, many others. I've done this all over the world, really, in hundreds of cities with many, many, many leaders, groups quite small, groups quite large. And the list goes on and on. But when our soul is connected, when we are deeply connected to our source of life in real time, like right here, right now, connected, not truths about God, not resolve to follow him, real life, in the moment, connection with God. When that happens, equally predictable symptoms emerge. When we have that sense of God being with us and for us, we see peace, we experience love, we find humility comes naturally. Passion, gratitude, energy, contentment, courage. Again, the list goes on and on. And if we put these up side by side, which I usually do on a whiteboard, and we just pause and look, we say, which one of these would you vote for? Right? Friends, here's the truth. We vote for one or the other of those things every day, sometimes multiple times a day. You do, I do, we do. Again, our beliefs may be strong, our commitment to ministry and family unwavering. But when we lose connection with God, we experience these symptoms. But the key is this. The symptoms are not the problem. And we usually try to fix the symptoms. The problem is disconnection. We've disconnected from our source. Do you notice how these symptoms come from so many different parts of life? Emotions, mental situations, thought process, creativity, things that are, speak about our gifting, those kinds of things. They come from all these domains because, again, soul is life. It's not just this toggle switch. There's a great quote from Dallas Willard in Renovation of the Heart where he says, fundamental aspects of life, such as art, sleep, sex, ritual, family, meaning roots, parenting, community, health, and meaningful work are all, in fact, soul functions. And they fail and fall apart to the degree that soul diminishes. And further, he says, when we speak of the human soul, we are speaking of the deepest level of life and power in the human being. 
Have you thought about that? What do you think is the deepest level of life and power in you? Is it your intellect? Is it your willpower? Is it your strength? Is it your ability to coerce or persuade? The deepest level of life and power is your soul. I've come to believe that your soul, and specifically your soul's well-being, drives everything that matters to you. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, that's what's real. And there are two related truths to the centrality of the soul. One is leadership is inevitable. What is not compelling about the kinds of people who are marked by those symptoms of soul health? They're a joy to be around, you want to be with them, you trust them, and they have good ideas about what to do next. Leadership is inevitable. But the second thing is leadership is dangerous. Leadership is dangerous, and usually this gets, we've heard some of this this morning in many different ways. Henry Nouwen, uh, a, a Catholic spiritual writer, uh, observed that nothing conflicts with love of Christ like service to Christ, and I would add leadership for Christ. So why exactly? Why is it so dangerous? We often, I think, believe that this has to do with the concepts of our pace of life, and the well-being of our soul. So I'm going to walk through some slides as quickly as I can to get you to what I hope will make some sense. When we think about pace of life and speed, we know it can be up and to the right, going crazy, more and more and more. And when that happens, we usually think of the soul diminishing almost with an inverse proportion to the pace of our life. Can't hear that still small voice. We don't have time to look people in the eye. We're just running and gunning. Now, if that's true, if there's always only an inverse relationship between those two, would it ever be true that you start growing in your soul and your spiritual life is going so well that your pace of life inversely correlated? Would you ever be so spiritually healthy that you're doing nothing? No. Okay, that's not the point either. So we have to have a different way of thinking about the relationship between speed and soul if we're going to lead well understanding how central the well-being of our soul is. So here's a different way to think about it, I hope will be helpful. When we begin our journey with God, the soul line sort of takes off. It's going up and to the right. Our soul is coming alive, it's so exciting. And naturally, especially if we're gifted in different areas of leadership, we get invited to do stuff by God and by people. And so the speed line starts to take off. We start moving, doing things, and it's kind of very up and to the right and very fun. I think of that as zone one. Zone two comes in when those lines start to get really close to one another. Maybe they start to cross a little bit. In zone two, God's asking us and inviting us to do things, and he is our source, but also people realize you're really good at stuff, and they ask you to do stuff. Sometimes God's in it, oftentimes not. And then all the other manner of things kick in, our pride, our need to be needed. All of a sudden, we start saying yes to things other than the Holy Spirit. And when that starts to happen, those lines begin to cross. It's confusing. We're not sure. Is it me? Is it God? What am I supposed to do? But if those lines do cross, and they do, when they do, this utterly predictable inverse relationship will happen. This is what I call the implosion of the center. Because if left as a runaway train of speed up and to the right, the soul will continue to diminish, diminish, diminish. And for a while, everything on the outside can still look pretty good. But eventually, that speed line will come down in correlation with an unhealthy soul. Now, some of you in the room might look at this, and you're in zone one. And I want to encourage you, like, up and to the right, enjoy it. Get mentors, get friends, pay attention to the well-being of your soul. But this is great. Zone two, again, pull people in. Get a spiritual director. Find a coach that can help you. Bring friends close to your growing discernment of is this God or is it me? What are the true motivations of what I'm doing? And if you're in zone three, I've been there. It is possible to recover. But I want to say please, 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 whatever it takes, arrest this 
decline. There is nothing more important. How would you benefit if you gained a big ministry and forfeited your soul, your family, your life? Zone four, I believe, is possible. And I call it Godspeed. If you ever get an email from me, I often sign Godspeed. Where your soul is driving your speed. And over time, God, now good and bad no longer is up and down. Good and bad, or it, it, up and down is more like, what is God directing? God may say, hey, I need you to slow it down for a season. It might be because he's raising up a different leader. It might be because there's an inner deep healing in your life that is about to happen, and you can't get to it if you're running so hard. But the million-dollar question for a Zone 4 leader is when they sense God saying, pull back, they will do what it takes to pull their pace under the direction of what they sense God leading them to. And it won't always be down. Sometimes it's like, hey, it's time to run hard and run fast right now this way. And a Zone 4 leader says, okay, I'm in, I'm ready. But the biggest issue is that the health of the soul is driving the pace of life, not the reverse. The pace of life is no longer driving the well-being of the soul. Friends, I believe we need a lot of zone four leaders. We're going to need self-awareness. We're going to need companions in that journey, but we can do it. And I want to leave you with one final image. I have a 26-year-old son who loves Jesus quite a bit, and uh, he sent me this one day. I want you to take it in for a second. There's an artist who said, if you love the form, you have everything to lose. If you love what gives it its form, you're free to receive whatever it's turning into. This whole morning is about the heart. This idea, this quote, this question is about your heart. What do you love? If you love the form, you're missing the point and prone to have a disordered heart. If you're caring for your soul, if you're open to what God's saying, if you are staying connected, you have the freedom. And friends, we as leaders need to be connected to that source so we can help shape what this is becoming. If there's any way I or the ministry around soul care can be helpful to you, I hope we can. We have a, a soul health assessment. The last thing we'll show you is a way you can uh, QR code that thing and start a self-assessment a, a self that will lead you to a, like a devotional that you can just process between you and God. What is current? What is real for me now? And however we can help you, um, we have a growing team of virtual connections that we can support you in, but we mostly, mostly want to leave you with the challenge that above all else, you would guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life, and it is, my friends, the wellspring of your leadership. Thank you.